So friends, welcome to the 178th session of Legal Empowerment through Interaction Lecture Series. In this journey, we had this wonderful speaker who is addressing us today on an earlier occasion as well. We were thoroughly impressed not only by the erudition, by the way in which he could uh, present the topic. I mean, it was so beautiful that we had requested him then itself that you should cover this topic today. And due to some other uh, uh, engagements, etc., it got delayed. But finally, sir has uh, agreed to address us today on uh, this topic of marine insurance. Mr. Sriram, sir, welcome back again to this platform. And we are privileged by the presence of Justice Ramkumar, sir, Justice Ramushan, sir, and all of you wonderful participants. The extended family, as we used to say, gathering now almost uh, every Saturday and Sunday uh, afternoons. So, without wasting any time, we'll go directly to Justice Sriram, sir. Sir, the stage is all yours. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Padman, Ram Kumar, Justice Ram Krishna, and all others. Very nice seeing you all again. We, in fact, uh, like uh, Mr. Padman said, after a long time we have had earlier also, we were talking about the dates. And it so happened last week I was called for one of the commitments today and I refused. Uh, one of the, I, I said I'm not available because then it could look improper for me to again postpone the date in the last minute. Uh, the topic of marine insurance, I like the way what uh, Sham had written, overview on marine insurance. But it's very, it was very correctly worded because marine insurance is a topic which is very vast. There are so many topics within marine insurance which would, uh, some of them, you can't even do it in one session. You know, it's really so vast and very interesting. You have so many case laws which you could look into. Uh, my attempt today is going to be to take you to the Marine Insurance Act because that also is codified here. And uh, we have followed the English 1857 Act. And then highlight some of the portions in the Marine Insurance Act which requires a little bit of emphasis. At the end, I'm going to send to Mr. Padman a list of some relevant judgments, you know, which uh, the legal practitioners and others interested can just go through so that you know the topic in more detail. Because if I try to emphasize on such topics, then we won't have enough time to uh, go through the entire Marine Insurance Act. And uh, marine insurance, for, for I, I would make it very clear that it is no rocket science, nothing so different from the general insurance uh, principles. Whatever you find in the general principles, what all an insurer had to do, what all an insurer has to do is all the same. It's just that the risk covered is different. And in view of the risk covered, certain provisions are slight provided in the Marine Insurance Act, which you may not find anywhere else. So, marine insurance is defined under Section 3 of the Marine Insurance Act 1963. And it says a contract of marine insurance is an agreement whereby the insurer undertakes to indemnify the assured. That is what you find in every insurance cover. In the manner and to the extent thereby agreed, that also is the same everywhere, against marine losses. Volume, volume. Can you not hear me? Yes. Uh, that is to say, the losses incidental to marine mm -hmm. adventure. So that is why this Marine Insurance Act has been created. And what is marine adventure? is also defined in Section 2D of the Act. And it says, any adventure where any insurable property is exposed to maritime perils, the earnings or acquisition of any freight, passage money, commission, profit, or other pecuniary benefit, or the security for any responses, loans. Okay. Is everything all right? Am I audible? Uh, I think Ram Kumar, no, sir, is there any issue? I have some, some problem. It is being rectified, being oh. attended to, being attended to. Carry oh. on, please. Oh. Uh, is endangered by yeah, the exposure yeah. of insurable property to maritime 
perils. Again, everything is maritime perils. Any liability to a third party may be incurred by the owner of or other person interested in or responsible for insurable property by reason of maritime perils. This is akin to a third party insurance that you will take for a motor vehicle. So now what is, so all marine adventure includes any adventure where a property is involved or somebody has a responsibility arising out of a maritime peril. Even maritime peril is defined under the Marine Insurance Act. And it is defined under subsection E of section 2, where it means a peril consequent on or incidental to the navigation of the sea. That is to say, perils of the sea, which are a lot of it includes uh, its act of God. Sea uh, fire, war perils, pirates, rovers, thieves, captures, seizures, restraints, etc., jettisons, barratry, and any other perils which are either of the like kind or may be designated by the policy. So the insurer and insurance company can add something else which will which can be defined to fall under the definition of a maritime peril. Now in a in a, in a marine insurance, what are the risks? The risks can happen at sea. That's what everybody would look at. There could be situations where some risk happens on shore as well. Because a cargo could be kept at a warehouse. It may come by road. And from the time it is being lifted from the truck side or a ship side, it's again that the, the, and the cargo moves over the ship's rails, the damage can happen. So it shouldn't happen that it happened on land, not at sea. So therefore, Section 4 takes care of that. It says a contract of marine insurance may by its express terms or by usage of trade ex be extended so as to protect the assured against losses on inland waters or on any land risk which may be incidental to any sea voyage. For example, you have the containers today which are stacked in the container yard, uh, you know, in the designated areas within the port. So a damage to the container or the cargo within the container can happen when it is being moved from the stacking yard to the ship's side and then being lifted by the ship's crane or the shore crane and loaded onto the uh, vessel. So that is why it takes care of both the land risk and also inland risk. Because there could also be <laughs> the cargo is being taken through uh, inland waters. It will still be covered under a marine risk. Then it has to be insured. Then what is very important in every insurance policy is the assured should have an insurable interest. Now what is an insurable interest? Because anybody can't I can't just go and insure somebody else's ship or cargo. Because if that cargo is lost or the ship is lost, am I going to suffer any loss? No. So therefore, I need to have the insured. When I say I mean the insured needs to have an insurable interest. An insurable interest also is defined under the marine insurance. And it is subject to the provision. Section 7 deals with it. Subject to the provisions of this act, every person has an insurable interest who is interested in a marine adv adventure. It could be an owner of a cargo. It could be an owner of a ship. It could be a voyage charterer who doesn't own the ship it, for the freight that he would be earning. It could be a time charter, again, who doesn't own the ship, but he's hiring the ship and he will lose freight and earnings. See, all these persons have an interest in the marine adventure. So they can have an insurable interest. And in particular, a person is interested in a marine adventure where he stands in any le legal or equitable relation to the adventure or to any insurable property at risk therein, in consequence of which, now this is where the who can be having an insurable interest. It says, in consequence of it, he may benefit by the safety or due arrival of the insurable property. That is, if he has insured the cargo, if it arrives safe, he benefits. 
by the safety or due arrival of insurable property or may be prejudiced by its loss or by damage thereto the cargo could be lost or by the detention thereof means it is detained somewhere now or may incur liability in respect thereof like for example a cargo it's a dangerous cargo it leaks causes damage to the port or to the uh, to the sea or to the ship so these are the person then one who benefits by the completion of the maritime adventure and if it doesn't happen who suffers a loss that is a person who has got an insurable interest and when in these interests when it should attach because when should he have because there could be a situation where the cargo is loaded uh, say in uh, singapore and then it is be it is sold by the seller to a buyer in bombay a and b have entered into a cargo sale contract cargo is loaded on the ship cargo is on its way to bombay b who is the buyer he endorses the policy and the documents in favor of c and the c goes and takes a delivery of the cargo so if the cargo suffers damage or loss it will be c who has paid to b for the cargo suffers but did he have an insurable interest when the cargo was loaded he did not have because the interest he got was later when he bought the cargo because even he is someone going back to 72 will benefit by the safety or due arrival of insurable property and may be prejudiced by its loss or damage so the insured must be interested in the subject matter insured at the time of the loss it does it is immaterial when he whether he had interest when it was loaded or it could be for example a, a ship she sails from say bombay to brazil in between the ship is sold in an interregnum port they would do a ship survey and say okay we are buying the ship the ship may get sold but so he gets and the ship after he buys some sinks or something happens to the ship so he should have an insurable interest at the time of the loss though he need not be interested when the insurance is effected so when the policy is taken he need not have an interest but when he suffer the loss happens he must have an interest in the uh, uh, interest and provided that where the subject matter is insured lost or not lost the assured may recover although he may not have acquired his interest until after the loss unless at the time of effecting the contract of insurance the assured was aware of the loss and the insurer was not there could be situations where <coughs> a, a, an importer of cargo would take a, a policy which covers for a period every shipment of uh say uh, dates which i import from iran to india i will declare the moment the goods are loaded i get the information that these goods are loaded he will inform the insurance company because he has already paid the uh, for a premium and entered into a cover for the whole period that's called like a floating policy that he has so every time the goods he receives information he will inform the insurance company and the insurance company will note the details of the ship in which it is loaded so that policy will be lost or not lost policy whether the goods are lost goods are not lost it is still covered but and he will still have an interest unless when he is informing them he gets aware he is aware of the loss of the cargo already incurred and that is where we will come later to the provisions of utmost good faith which is required under every insurance policy then i'll skip some of the other provisions then we go straight to assignment of interest section 17 deals with assignment of interest where the assured assigns or otherwise parts with his interest in the subject matter insured <laughs> he does not thereby transfer to the assignee his rights under the contract of insurance 
unless there is an express or implied agreement with the assignee <coughs> to that effect so he can assignment of his insurable interest is also possible there are situations where see normally you cannot assign a and b enters into a contract b cannot assign the contract to c without the without his knowledge but in a in a, there is an exception to cargo cover because cargo is always many a times or most of the times are sold in high seas so every time a sale happens it could be a cif contract or the uh, c and f contract so whoever takes insurance policy the cargo interest who has bought the uh, goods he may assign the he may sell the goods to somebody else thereby he will also by endorsement assign the policy to the buyer so that is where there is an exception for in in cargo cover you don't need to take the insurance company's permission before assignment because that is what is uh, there is an implied agreement or usage of trade you can say then comes uh, the, the section 19 which deals with insurance is uberi mai fedai it is that is I'm called at most uh, uh, a contract of marine insurance is a contract based upon the utmost good faith and if the utmost good faith be not observed by either party the contract may be avoided by the other party before i go into let's see the next section also section 20 subject disclosure by assured subject to the provisions of this section the assured must disclose to the insurer before the contract is concluded every material circumstance which is known to the assured and the assured is deemed to know every such circumstance which in the ordinary course of business ought to be known to him if the assured fails to make such disclosure the insurer may avoid the contract now what is every material circumstance is discussed in the subsection 2 of 20 says that every circumstance is material which would influence the judgment of a prudent insurer in fixing the premium or determining whether he will take the risk i'll deal with this with an example of a matter of, of a case it's like let, let's start with a simple thing where uh, you have a car you take an insurance policy for a car and uh, uh you know the car's brake is not functioning properly or you ought to know that the brakes are not functioning you still take an insurance policy you drive the car the car meets with an accident the insurance company will say you ought to have told me there is a problem with the insurer uh, with the with the brake so therefore it was a material circumstance for so in this case which i am going to tell you a purchase the ship from singapore for breaking in alang she was a twin screw huge 40000 she had two engines of 20000 bhp each I mean it was it was a huge island by itself floating it was a uh, over an oil carrier very large over an oil carrier from singapore through the malacca strait etc she came with just one engine to the anchorage at alang the buyer takes an insurance policy it's called a funeral voyage policy so so i mean that's what the industry would call so she takes off in under her own power i said i told you she came under her own her own power from singapore to the alang anchorage and under her own power she went for beaching before she it was a distance of just some 9 kilometers before she reached the beaching point 
she lost her rudder what happened we don't know she started drifting maybe there were cross currents and she started drifting and sat 3000 feet away from the spot where she was supposed to be and uh, settled down because the water level was less it's it was a huge i said it was like an island on its sea i'm not talking about a Uh, the, the Dolly Parton song "Islands in the Stream," but the, it, it, it was a huge vessel, and Alang is a tidal port. So the tide water receded; it ebbed. She sat, settled down. Next day, again there was high tide. She went up, ebbed, sat down. Third day, she went up, sat down, broke her back. so there was no way and uh, where that the, the insured said she has lost her species because the ship is broken midway she is no more you can't refloat her you can't repair her the she the, the insurance company took a stand that there was non disclosure and there was a breach of utmost good faith and non disclosure of a material fact now what was the non disclosure they were saying that she had only one engine functioning the assured said with the request for cover we sent to you the agreement the fact that one engine was not functioning was not mentioned in the main agreement it was there in the addendum the insurance company said we never got the addendum we got only the main agreement so then it went into trial and cross examining the insurance company manager and then of course it was accepted that the addendum was there so they were refused to give the cover finally the assured succeeded refusing to pay under the for the cover because according to them there was a breach of good faith you never dispend non disclosure of a material fact the assured led evidence to prove that even assuming it was a non disclosure still the fact that she was go, uh, having only one engine functioning was not a material fact and for that naval architects marine engineers master mariners were all called as experts to give evidence and various tests speed tests were calculated and given squatting effect how when the ship squats when she is reaching the core all those tests were done to show that what was undisclosed even if we accept as undisclosed or not disclosed was not a material fact of course they didn't have to go into that because it was accepted that uh, uh, it was disclosed so therefore this is very, very very relevant even like if you take a health health cover medical insurance policy you are expected to disclose whether you are a diabetic or you have had a history of uh, cardio diseases or any other ailment which will influence the judgment of the insurer in fixing the premium or to determine whether he will take the risk itself if you have had lot of ailments all kinds of you have had three heart attacks he will say i don't want to give you a medical cover so so therefore he will he can decide whether he needs to give you a cover or not so these are circumstances which this 19 and 20 we can go on for uh, you know one full session on that then then next is whether and it also says whether any particular circumstance is not disclosed be material or not in each case is a question of fact so then the then it comes many a times we uh, the insured does not apply for a cover directly as always an agent who gets the insurance cover that also is taken care of under 
it says subject to the provisions of the preceding section, which means that is Uberma Fedai and disclosure. As to the circumstances which need not be disclosed, where an insurance is effected by the assured by an agent, for the assured by an agent, the agent must disclose to the insurer every material circumstance which is known to himself and an agent to insure is deemed to know every such circumstance which in the ordinary course of business ought to be known by or to have been communicated to him and every material circumstance which the assured is bound to disclose unless it comes to his knowledge too late to communicate it to the agent. So even the agent basically stands in the same footing as the assured so far as disclosure is concerned. Then the, the representation spending negotiation of contract, every rep material representation, see everywhere they use the term material. If we, all like for example, you're insuring a, a ship, few bulbs are missing or the bulbs are not burning in the accommodation. That's a material for the insurance cover. But if you say the steering is not going to port side, but only onto the starboard side, that is very material. So every material representation made by the assured or his agent to the insurer during the negotiations of the contract and before the contract is concluded must be true. If be untrue, the insurer may avoid the contract. If you see all these things, it says may avoid the contract. So insurance company may still go ahead and uh, pay under the contract for whatever reasons. A, a representation is again material which would influence the judgment of a prudent insurer in fixing the premium or determining whether he will take the risk. And whether it is a fact, everything depends on the facts and circumstances of the case. Then comes, when is the insurance contract deemed to be concluded? A contract of marine insurance is deemed to be concluded when the proposal of the assured is accepted by the insurer. Whether the policy be then issued or not, and for the purpose of showing when the proposal was accepted, reference may be made to the slip covering note or other customary memorandum of the contract, although it be unstamped. But in London those days, even now you have those Lloyds, the whole building, Lloyds, which is of insurers. There will be many people, they used to have a table, they would slip, they will send a slip, whether you need to cover, each one will endorse how much he is willing to cover. That's why it's called a slip, you know, a slip is sent around. So, the moment they sign and accept, the contract is concluded. It need, the policy need not have been issued or uh, because although it be unstamped because contract of insurance requires stamp duty to be paid. So it looks like I haven't come across the situation, but it looks like an exception to section 39 of the Indian Stamp Act, you know, where uh, it doesn't have any evidentiary uh, value. So, then where should the contract be embodied? A contract of marine insurance shall not be admitted in evidence unless it is embodied in a marine policy in accordance with this act. The policy may be executed and issued either at the time when the contract is concluded or afterwards. So you, the moment you sign the slip and agree to take the cover, a contract is concluded. That is not the time when you are issuing the insurance uh, uh, policy. You will issue the insurance policy later. So your contract has to be embodied in the insurance policy. Then 25 talks about what policy must specify, the name of the assured, subject matter, voyage or time or the sums insured, name of the insurers, etc. Then signature, voyage and time policies. There are different kinds of uh, uh, there are voyage policies and time policies. It can be voyage as you know, 
is for a particular voyage you can take a cover like you're take, taking a car taxi from cochin to trivandrum that's right or you may say i need the car to be used for a week at my disposal that's for the time of duration the car so you can take a voyage policy or you can take a time policy and you may take both in the same policy the then valued policy is where the value of the loss to be suffered the subject matter of the uh, property insured is disclosed unvalued policy is where it is not shown then floating policy by ship or ships uh, the then you have double insurance where two or more policies are affected by or on behalf of the assured on the same adventure and interest or any part thereof and the sums insured exceed the indemnity allowed by this act for example you have a car or let's say you have a you are you have a ship because we are talking of marine policy the ship value of the ship is say 10 crores you have gone and taken the insurance policy from two underwriters you would have taken for 8 crores from one at say paying a premium of 6 lakhs then you would find somebody offering the same 8 crores cover for 2 lakhs so you there is a double insurance but you will not get 16 crores from 8 uh, crores each if the value of the ship is 10 crores you may at the maximum get 10 crores but if you have taken only one cover and you have valued it at 8 crores and you know the insured value is shown as 8 crores whereas the actual value of the goods or the property is 10 crores to the extent of 2 crores you are your own insured because you have under insured the, uh, the the goods or the property the just going a little on the side the when there is a cargo in uh, cover the 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 what the international chamber of commerce the they 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 felt the uncard the united nations conference on trade and development felt that the earlier insurance policies that were being given were not very happily worded were not enough so they came with what you call the institute clauses and many of these institute clauses form part of the marine insurance cover if you see a cargo cover insurance uh, cover it would say which are what are included in the cargo cover then they the for the icc a icc b icc c icc stands for institute cargo clauses a b and c it is like maruti zx maruti vx and maruti uh, uh, the the base model so icc a is the highest and uh, this is how it looks like if you you can get it on line or even any of the insurance book so icc clauses underwent changes in 2009 not many but basically the old one was uh, retained uh, where under icc a everything is covered it's an all risk policy which is uh, what they they call it's like a fully loaded car automatic uh, leather seats rear view camera all put in together so any loss that the cargo suffers due to any insurance any marine uh, maritime risk marine risk or in the marine adventure will be covered under the institute cargo clauses a then you have cargo clauses b it is like from zx you come down to vx where the which are the risk covered are specified it 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 covers about 10 of them 10 items it says the like like in the icc a risk covered 
the insurance covers all risks of loss of or damage to the subject matter insured except as excluded by the provisions of 4 5 6 and 7 so everything is covered except those which are excluded by the exclusions you find under the icc b it says insurance covers except as excluded by provisions 4 5 6 and 7 below with what are the covers loss of or damage to the subject matter insured reasonably attributable to fire or explosion vessel or craft being stranded grounded sunk or capsized overturning collision of the vessel discharge of cargo at a port of distress earthquake general average sacrifice etc and icc c is the typical base model car that you will uh, buy and that covers fewer risk than what was there in icc b so the the it also provides the one of the most important things in icc you will find is the duration of the cover there is because this deals with cargo the cargo today comes in containers containers are transshipped so there is a you are taking an insurance cover from bombay to say singapore for moving of the cargo your cover is for a to point a to point b but with containerization and all the uh, shuttling of vessels it may be unloaded in colombo and from colombo depending on which shipping line has its hub where so from colombo it may go to probably kuala lumpur and from kuala lumpur she will be put in another cargo will be put in a, in a third ship and taken to singapore but you are not going directly so during the interregnum period when the cargo is in the port waiting to be reloaded on to or transshipped into another vessel there could be a loss so whether it is covered during that period because it's not in the sea and it's not at the time of loading and unloading or soon after loading or unloading it could be that by the time vessel a comes due to some problem she the, the misses like you're missing a connecting flight you may have to stay at the airport for a day or two before you get the next uh, flight available so during that waiting if a loss happens what do you do so that is where duration it provides for transit clause and it says subject to clause 11 below and uh, 11 is talking of insurable interest the insurance attaches from the time the subject matter insured is first moved in the warehouse or at the place of storage at the place named in the contract of insurance so even for example you can insure this cargo under this cover from icd tuglakabad to gujarat port and uh, from mundra to any other place so it's also doing a road uh, or a train movement for the purpose or uh, in the warehouse or at for the purpose of the immediate loading into or onto the carrying vessel or other conveyance for the commencement of transit continues during the ordinary course of transit and when does this terminate the con it's very very clearly mentioned a on completion of unloading from the carrying vehicle or other conveyance in or at the final warehouse or place of storage at the destination named in the contract of insurance on completion of unloading from the carrying vehicle or other conveyance in or at any other warehouse or place of storage where whether prior to or at the destination named in the contract of carriage which the assured or i or their employees elect to use either for storage other than in the ordinary course of transit or for allocation or distribution or when the assured or their employees elect to use any carrying vehicle or other conveyance or any container for storage other than in the ordinary course of transit and then finally you bring the cargo to the port 
on the expiry of 60 days after the completion of discharge oversight of the subject matter insured from the overseas vessel at the port of discharge, whichever shall first occur. Then you there are there are tokens that if for any reason the cargo is not moved, you are unable to get customs clearance. Then you can request the insurance company to hold the cargo covered by by paying some additional uh, uh, premium. So the, the, these are the uh, uh, probably covers which you get for cargo. Similarly, you have institute time clauses for hulls of the ship. Then you have institute voyage clauses for hulls of the ship, which also provides for uh, what is the, the ship is covered. It's like first party car cover that you have. It also provides for three-fourth collision liability because a, a ship may also have a third party PNI cover. That's protection and indemnity cover. So in case of a collision, the hull insurer takes the one three fourth of the liability. One fourth is taken by the PNI uh, club where the vessel is entered with. So now going back to the uh, act, we have warranties. This is not like you have a regular contract condition and warranty, you know, where a condition you can terminate the contract warranty you can claim damages then you have the intermediary clause provisions here a warranty is viewed as an a condition in an insurance policy it is a warranty means a promissory warranty that is to say a warranty by which the assured undertakes that some particular thing shall or shall not be done or that some conditions will be fulfilled or whereby he agrees or affirms or negatives the existence of a particular state of facts. For example, you take a, a voyage cover of a, say, let's say you have a, 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 sh a small ship. You're taking a voyage cover from Bombay to Dubai. And you also tell the insurance company the route which you are going to take. So based on that, the insurance company will assess the risk and also determine whether it needs to give you a cover. A bob, you, and if you go beyond the route, which you have informed the insurance company, or you take a, say, a, a, a time cover, you are insuring your ship for one year, then, but you say, I will not take the ship to Iranian waters or I will not take the ship near the Chinese waters. That's a warranty which you have entered into with the insurance company. The moment you breach the warranty, the policy lapses. You may have come back. You may have gone to Iran and come back with no problem. But then the, after you come back and resume your regular voyage, you suffer a loss. The insurance company can avoid the contract because you have committed a breach of the warranty. If it says where a warranty may be expressed or implied, a warranty as above defined, that is under 35.1, is a condition which must be exactly complied with, whether it be material to the risk or not. So therefore, you know, you're going to Iran and coming back and later your ship runs aground or hits a, an iceberg you can't say that, oh, that has nothing to do with me going to Iran. So it says, whether it be material to the risk or not, if not be so complied with, then subject to any express provision in the policy, the insurer is discharged from liability as from the date of the breach of warranty, but without prejudice to any liability incurred by him before that day. Because he is discharged from liability from the date of the breach of warranty. So the moment the ship has entered Iranian waters, the insurance company is discharged from the liability from the date it entered the Iranian waters when the breach of warranty was committed. That's why it said whether it is material to the risk or not. But, but before entering, 
if there has been any damage to the ship, that he will be liable under the, as provided under the Act. So then it says, when breach of warranty is excused, this has been so strict that the English Act has undergone some amendment that it has to be material. And once it comes back, then it will still be covered. Uh, when when non-compliance with the warranty is excused, when by reason of change of circumstances, the warranty ceases to be applicable to the circumstances of the contract, or when compliance with the warranty is rendered unlawful by any subsequent law. The, uh, the, the, there, there could also be a warranty which is excused where your vessel runs, uh, suffers from engine failure. You can't complete the voyage. You need to enter a place where it is not, you are warranted you will not enter as a port of refuge. That could uh, uh, the, the uh, cover. That, that, that won't be take, considered as a breach of warranty. And where a warranty is broken, the assured cannot avail himself of the defense that the breach has been remedied. It means I have come back from Iranian waters to the regular waters. And the warranty complied with before the loss happened. And a breach of warranty may be waived by the insurer. You may be like Shipping Corporation of India. You've got so many ships covered with oriental insurance. You're paying huge amounts of premium every year. You wouldn't want to uh, uh, displease the ship owner. You may say, all right, you went to Iran and came back. Nothing happened. Good boy, please don't do that again. Continue. You know, that, that is also possible by the insurance company. Then we will skip some and then warranty of seaworthiness of ship. That's 41. In a voyage policy, there is an implied warranty that at the commencement of the voyage, the ship shall be seaworthy for the purpose of the particular adventure insured. There are two policies earlier we mentioned, we saw under the Act, time policies and voyage policies. When it comes to a ship, if the cover is for a voyage, then there is an implied warranty that at the commencement of the voyage, the ship shall be seaworthy for the purpose of the particular adventure insured. Where the policy attaches while the ship is in port, there is also an implied warranty that she shall, at the commencement of the risk, be reasonably be fit to encounter the ordinary perils of the port. If you are saying from, there, are, there is a difference, you know, at, at and from Bombay to Dubai. Or from Bombay to Dubai. That if the loss happens, when you say at and from, so when she is staying in the port of Bombay, she ought to be seaworthy to encounter the ordinary perils of the port. Where the policy relates to a voyage which is performed in different stages during which the ship requires different kinds of or further preparation or equipment, there is an implied warranty that at the commencement of each stage, the ship is seaworthy in respect of such preparation or equipment for the purpose of that stage. You may be taking a, sh a cargo a ship from Bombay to Alaska. You will be going through various ports. Closer to Alaska, you may have water which has got ice or frozen water. So during that time, your ship must be equipped that of each stage, she is seaworthy in respect of such preparation or equipment for the purposes of that stage. A ship is deemed to be Seaworthy when she is reasonably fit in all respects to encounter the ordinary perils of the seas of the adventure insured. They are not asking you to do anything extra. Whatever is ordinary in a sea a voyage, you have to be covered for that. Now, here is a, an exception. In a time policy, which means you have taken an insurance cover for 
say uh, six months. In a time policy, there is no implied warranty that the ship shall be seaworthy at any stage of the adventure. So a ship in a period of six months will go from various port to port. So there is no warranty that every time she sails off from a particular port, she the, that she shall be seaworthy for the purpose of that particular adventure. But where with where with the privity of the assured, the ship is sent to sea in an unseaworthy state. The insurer is not liable for any loss attributable to unseaworthiness. So in a time policy, the vessel suffers a loss. There is no breed, a warranty of seaworthiness at the commencement of that voyage when she suffered a loss or she was lost. But if with the privity of the assured, the ship was sent in an unseaworthy state, then the insurance company will not pay you. So, but with the privity of the assured, therefore the owners, because they, but where with the privity of the assured, the ship is sent to sea, that the onus is on the insurance company to prove that A, the ship was unseaworthy during that particular uh, uh, voyage, and B, she was sent in that unseaworthy state with the privity of the assured. So this is the double onus on the insurance company to prove to avoid payment under the insurance policy. Similarly, in a policy on goods or other movables, there is no implied warranty that the goods or movables are seaworthy. And in a voyage policy on goods or other movables, there is an implied warranty that at the commencement of the voyage, the ship is not only seaworthy as a ship, but she, she also she is reasonably fit to carry the goods. For example, in, it, it says you don't have, there is no warranty that the goods will be seaworthy. But if you are insuring the goods for a particular voyage, you, you ought to ensure that the ship on which you are sailing is not only seaworthy as a ship, but she is also reasonably fit to carry the goods or other mobiles to the destination contemplated by the policy. It's like you can't take, uh, arrange for a small uh, fishing dhow to take your cargo from point A to, uh, say, say, from Mumbai to, say, United States of America. She may not be fit to carry the goods to the destination contemplated by the policy. Then the uh, implied condition as to commencement of risk. You can skip that. Then comes alteration of port of departure. You have insured the goods from the subject matter is insured by a voyage policy at and from or from a particular place. And you alter that place of departure where the place of departure is specified by the policy. And say your place of departure is given as Bombay. And the ship, instead of sailing from that place, sails from any other place. She sails from Cochin. The risk does not attach. Then from Bombay, you have, you, 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 the policy says from Bombay, you will go to, say, Singapore. But in terms of Singapore, she goes to Dubai. So where the destination is specified in the policy, that Singapore is specified in the policy, and the ship, instead of sailing for that destination, sails for any other destination, the risk does not attach. So we are here talking of sailing. That is from the time of departure, the moment she sets sail from the port. 
but after sailing towards singapore you may decide to change the voyage instead of going to singapore i have left for singapore from bombay but midway i decide to go to say dubai where after the commencement of the risk the destination of the ship is voluntarily changed from the destination contemplated by the policy there is said to be a change of voyage and unless the policy otherwise provides where there is a change of voyage the insurer is, is discharged from liability as from the time of change that is as from the time when the determination to change it is manifested and it is immaterial that the ship may not in fact have left the course of voyage contemplated by the policy when the loss occurs this would mean that you may decide that instead of going to dubai midway you say i'll go instead of going to singapore i'm going to dubai so that determination to change the voyage is manifested you may then change your mind no 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 i'll go back go continue on the old still the insurance come insurer will be discharged from the time uh, as from the time of change then it then there is deviation why you deviated where a ship without unlaw without lawful excuses deviates from the voyage contemplated by the policy the insured is discharged from liability as from the time of deviation and it is immaterial that the ship may have regained her route before any loss occurs you know that difference between deviation and change of voyage you have decided say i'm taking the same example so we understand easily so bombay to singapore you are taking the route of via colombo to singapore so you decide from bombay instead of going to colombo singapore you go to dubai there is a change of voyage <clears throat> but deviation occurs when instead of going via colombo you deviate go to dubai and then go to singapore there is no change of voyage but you have deviated without a lawful excuse from the voyage contemplated by the policy from that time the insurance company is relieved of its liability under the policy the intention to deviate is immaterial there must be a deviation in fact to discharge the insurer from his liability under the contract then there is delay then excuse for deviation or delay is also provided for the uh, where the, the deviation or delay in prosecuting the voyage contemplated by the policy is excused where caused by circumstances beyond the control of the master or his employer for example there is rough west, uh, uh, weather and the vessel suffers the engine failure or power failure and they need to put into a, a port of refuge or where necessary for the safety of the ship or subject matter insured for saving human life like for example you are going straight from bombay to colombo and instead of why on the way you suddenly find another ship you get an sos message that a little off towards dubai there is a ship just 10 miles away in danger you may deviate to save life and property there that is excuse or surgical or medical aid is required or barratrous conduct of the master or crew when and when the cause excusing the deviation or delay ceases to operate the ship must resume her course and prosecute her voyage with reasonable dispatch then we are coming to assignment of policy when and how policy is assignable a marine policy may be transferred by assignment unless it contains terms expressly prohibiting assignment it may be assigned either before or after law where a marine policy has been assigned so as to pass the beneficial insurer interest in that policy the assignee of the policy is entitled to sue thereon in his own name and the defendant is entitled to make any defense arising out of the contract which he would have been entitled to make if the suit had been brought in the name of the person by or on behalf of whom the policy was effected this is like a the seller it was it's a cif sale the seller of the goods 
takes an insurance cover because parties may decide it may be cheaper to take an insurance cover in the uh, seller's place or in the buyer's place so the buyer will decide where he will want the insurance cover to be taken let us take it assume that this is a say the seller in australia of coal takes an insurance policy for discharge in gujarat and the buyer or the buyer could be in singapore but port of discharge will be gujarat so the singapore by the contract of insurance is with the seller in australia and the insurance company the buyer in singapore will end up with to his buyer in gujarat so the policy is assigned from a the seller to b the buyer and from b the buyer to c his buyer so the it it shouldn't happen that i didn't have a contract with you or the insurance company or the car, insurer would insured will say you can't sue me because the cargo was dangerous i didn't have an insurance cover with you so that when there is an assignment of a cargo per cover both can sue in their own name i'll just run through then premium then partial loss and total loss uh a loss could be partial or total loss any loss these are all topics where i we can easily spend one full session uh any loss other than a total loss is a partial loss total loss can be two kinds actual total loss or a constructive total loss actual total loss everybody knows a ship sinks somewhere you don't know what has happened it's an actual total loss but what is a constructive total loss constructive total loss is where the assured is deprived let us see the ship has gone like the example i gave you uh, of the ship drifting and then sitting 3000 feet away from the port where she was supposed to beach she and let us assume she had not broken her back then to remove the ship from the place where she is the cost of removal will exceed the value of the ship itself insured value of the ship itself or let us say uh, that would amount to a constructive total loss or let us give you an example of you have purchased logs from kuala lumpur to calcutta 40 lakhs worth of logs ship runs into engine problem from kuala lumpur she calls into singapore and at singapore the ship gets arrested and from singapore finally after uh, 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 furnishing security the owner says now i can't complete the voyage my crew has all abandoned you want you can take delivery of the goods the cost of taking delivery of the goods there by then few uh, and finding an alternate ship transshipping and then bringing it to calcutta would cost say 50 lakhs of rupees the cost of recovering the goods would exceed the value when recovered so therefore that is a situation where it amounts to constructive total loss and in such cases you have to give a notice of abandonment to the insurance company and it says 62 says uh so 61 says effect of constructive total loss where there is a constructive total loss the assured may either treat the loss as a partial loss or abandon the subject matter insured to the insurer and treat the loss as if it were an actual total loss and the notice of abandonment where the assured elects to abandon the subject matter insured to the insurer he must give notice of abandonment if he fails to do so it can be treated only as a partial loss then notice of abandonment should be given by given in writing by word of mouth or party in writing or by word of mouth and there is no 
uh, prescribed format, but the intention should be that the subject matter insured is unconditionally abandoned to the insurer. And it must be given with reasonable diligence after the receipt of reliable information of the loss, where the information is of a doubtful character. The assured is entitled to a reasonable time to make inquiry. Then acceptance of an abandonment may be either express or implied from the conduct of the insurer. The mere silence after notice is not an acceptance. And where it is accepted, the abandonment is irrevocable. The acceptance of notice conclusively admits liability for the loss and the sufficiency of the notice. So the moment you give a notice of abandonment and the insurance company accepts the notice, that notice it admits liability for the loss and that notice was sufficient. And notice of abandonment may be waived by the insurer. And when the insurer has reinsured his risk, no notice of abandonment need be given by him. Then effect of abandonment. Where there is a valid abandonment, the insurer is entitled to take over the interests of the assured in whatever may remain of the subject matter insured and all proprietary rights incidental thereto. So like I gave the example of the logs, the insurance, the moment it accepts the notice of abandonment, the insurance company pays the insured, the insured value, and then takes steps to dispose of the logs in Singapore so that it recovers part of the amount paid. Then salvage charges incurred in preventing a loss by perils insured may be also recovered as a loss by those perils. If, if the ship has run aground, and you engage the services of a salver. Those salvage services are also covered under the policy. And then there is general average loss, which is very peculiar to this maritime field. A general average loss is a loss caused by or directly consequential on a general average act. It, includes general average expenditure as well as general average sacrifice. What happens is, let us take a situation where a ship is sailing with, uh, say, 100 containers on the deck and about 300 containers below the deck inside the holes. So the way the containers are stacked also will have, they will have to take into the meta center and the balance of the ship so that she doesn't unnecessarily tilt to list to one side. Midway, rough sea, one of the container lashings, let us assume, comes off. Or few of the, on one side, the containers fall off. So there is excess weight on one side and there is less weight on the other side. So the car, the ship may start listing. Let us say it has fallen off from the starboard side and the ship starts listing a bit towards port side. If the captain of the ship feels that the listing is too dangerous and he's unable to correct the list, he may decide to sacrifice some of the containers on the port side so that she corrects herself. So that sacrifice which he makes is called a general average sacrifice for the purpose of the benefit of all the marine adventure. If it, it had not, if that sacrifice had not been done, possibly the ship would have capsized. There would have been loss to the ship. There would have been loss to the cargo. There could have been loss of freight as well. So to prevent such a loss for the entire maritime adventure, he makes a sacrifice. Now what happens? The cargo owner will say, why did you throw my goods into the sea? It was your problem. You did not do anything to, you had not lashed the containers properly. So you had a problem. Those things will all come up. But for the loss, let us take it's a straight case. So for the loss, which has been caused to the cargo interest by, the sac by sacrificing their cargo, 
somebody has to pay for it now who will pay for it so it will be paid by those who benefited by that sacrifice now who have benefited the ship owner has benefited because otherwise the ship would have capsized other cargo interests have also benefited otherwise the ship would have sunk and they would have also lost the cargo if somebody would have earned freight only on delivery of the cargo so that freight also is saved because that cargo could be delivered so each one will contribute on the basis of the benefit that they have derived or uh, how uh, they have got by such a general average sacrifice so that is very peculiar to general average provisions then extent of liability then partial loss partial loss of uh, then then we go straight to suing and labor clause which is very interesting that is uh, section 78 where the policy contains a suing and laboring clause the engagement thereby entered into is deemed to be supplementary to the contract of insurance and the assured may recover from the insurer any expenses properly incurred pursuant to the clause notwithstanding that the insurer may have paid for a total loss or that the subject matter may have been warranted free from particular average either wholly or so and so it would also incur general average losses and contributions and salvage charges so the ship owner who would have contributed to the extent of the loss suffered by those goods which he had sacrificed that also is covered under the sue and labor cost or expenses incurred for the purpose of averting or diminishing any loss not covered by the policy are not covered so where he incurs an expense to because by that expense even the insurance company benefits because otherwise there would have been a huge claim a huge claim to that extent can be claimed under the sue and labor policy then right of subrogation that everybody must be aware when an insurance company pays uh under the policy it gets subrogated to the rights of the assured and that can be in under various uh, ways so when the right of the assured is assigned uh, subrogated it's a equitable assignment they call the the insurance company cannot sue in subrogation in its own name it sues in the name of the assured along by add, along with adding its own name so it takes a para fraternity from the assured and conducts the suit against the third party because the purpose is a third party who caused loss should not be allowed to go scot free because the the assured has received his money he wouldn't bother to sue a third party so insurance company is subrogated to the rights of the assured and he will sue in the name of the assured the third party that is subrogation and when there is a failure of consideration the insurance company has to uh, return the premium there are various uh, many other details which we can go into but we have already i think mr padman done one and a half hours close to one and a half hours and with, time is not an issue sir no but but with not talking all these years except for judgment dictating my job <laughs> words after some time <laughs> i think these are basically the overview of the marine insurance act you know these are more more important and uh, uh, specific and what i'll do mr padman is i'll uh, uh send you by whatsapp some of the judgments like yes, sir on uber me fedai then i have it's on onus to prove loss of cargo due to perils of sea on the the on the cargo i will circulate sir among the groups sir. what I'll is it, what is insurable interest then warranties institute construct classification clause when constitutes waiver what is constructive total loss what is on subrogation then jurisdiction then sue and labor what it is what i mentioned now jurisdiction supreme court has now said there was one matter it is uh, 2019 12 scc 751 where the assured went to the consumer forum and the insurance company said there is an arbitration clause so supreme court said consumer forum is addition to arbitration section 3 then ha ah, so is so so that is also very 
uh, important, I felt. So I'll just uh, send you a snapshot of this or I'll email a WhatsApp to you. So either way, sir, I, I'll take care of that. So then you can uh, circulate it. To yes. Me. Now, anyone wants anything? Sir, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I always wondered when a parcel is delivered in car, it's called shipment. And when it is delivered in ship, it's called a cargo. Sorry? When a uh, parcel is delivered in a car, it is called shipment. And uh, when it is delivered through a ship, it is called a cargo. Uh, I, I, mean, also when I read that somebody was mentioning about these two strange things. No, so somebody was, had mentioned there was someone gave an answer also. Whether that was reliable or not, I don't know. Uh, and I, of course, I don't remember what it was. <laughs> it was very interesting. Sir, so, so we'll have the comments from Justice Ramkumar sir first. Sir, please, you muted yourself, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. Audible, audible. Yeah. Some accident here also. <laughs> Not on the ICs. <laughs> Excellent articulation by Justice Sriram on marine insurance law. I am totally ignorant of the provisions of this act because I had no occasion to cover this uh, subject either as a lawyer or as a judge. But the miseries and wonders of uh, sea and the adventures of seafarers on the ocean, on the high seas, have always fascinated man. It was with great interest that I watched uh, Poseidon Adventure and uh, that uh, other movie Titanic. Seldom we laymen realize the intricacies of voyage policies or time policies, seaworthiness of vessels, the observance or breach of warranties, transgressions of uberime fidi insurance contract, etc. Uh, great exposure you have given us. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Justice Ramkumar, sir. Over to you, Justice mm -hmm. Ramakrishna, sir. Yes, really. Is, I think that the marine insurance is more very particular and meticulous in covering every aspect that is generally all those things will be contained in the policy class every will be subject to the conditions of the policy this but indian act is of which year 1963 sir Thank i you. think as, is, as, as a marine insurance act is concerned i think that everything is specific in the act itself Which there is one difference i find from the general insurance and this because if a third party insurance you will be covered by everything will be subject to the conditions in the policy Hmm. So everything will be inscribed in the, uh, the policy only and the contract provides. But as far as the marine insurance is concerned, I think everything has been explained. There is one advantage I find from the marine insurance act when I, when I am going through along with you when the, it is being read. So it's a very nice class because as Ramkumar has said, we don't have any, uh, because some official lawyers, we don't have any exposure of marine insurance or marine, except the third party insurance with the a vehicle, vehicle insurance and the motor, motor claims. Mm -hmm. And uh, otherwise, we don't have any exposure on this. It's a very informative study that has been given. Thank you very much, Sri Ram. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Justice Ram, uh, Ramakrishnan, sir. Uh, from uh, sea to the air, we'll have the comments of aviation expert, K. Vijay Rao, sir. Good evening, sir. Very well articulated. Like During the program, somebody was talking about discussing air insurance also. The terms and conditions are more or less the same. They don't have specific insurance act, but it is governed by the Air Carriage Act, which is uh, apportioned by the DGCA. They, they do the rules. See, there is, a, there is a lot of difference between sea insurance and air insurance. Because sea insurance, the perishable cargo is not as much carried as in the air insurance. Air insurance, people like, like vegetables and fruits. They want it delivered. So that's another aspect. Another thing is in the sea insurance, uh, there is la insurance payable by the company for death on board the on board the ship. Whereas on the air, there is no uh, liability of the airline for a death occurring on board the the aircraft, a natural death or an unnatural death. I mean, unnatural death is a separate thing, but natural death that is again covered by uh, the individual's insurance. The, there was the reason is in the maritime thing they have a doctor on board the ship so he takes care they have a medical bay whereas on the aircraft we don't have such kind of things so that was one of the reasons in fact it was contemplated to carry doctors on board also 
but then there was advice not to do it because the insurance liability would be very phenomenal so we normally normally in such case of incidents we call for a doctor page for a doctor on board normally the manifest of the passengers carries a list of doctors and uh, pilots or any other crew that is traveling this is and we mark it the, the chief of the uh, cabin crew will mark those names for for the emergency requirement so we page for a doctor when earlier as a complement the airline used to either upgrade that passenger for the rest of his travel or uh, the doctor for the rest of his travel or complimentary wine or champagnes were given till we had one doctor who said no i'm not happy with this you'll have to pay for my services and he sued air india and we lost so after that we decided that you know we make an announcement saying if you are willing to volunteer to help and the crew are basically trained for first aid and uh, most of our uh, flight paths uh, even even on, the, even on the long range flights we are barely 2 hours flight time to a land destination Hmm. so that's how the flight path is normally uh, programmed so that's that's how it is and very well said i mean the clauses that have been gone here are more or less the clauses that are applicable even in an air insurance where a person has uh, the low cost carriers basically have a very low liability on insurance and that is why your tickets are cheaper whereas scheduled airlines the, your life is also insured in case of an eventuality so The, the the flight tickets are a little bit on the higher side but more or less otherwise the parameters are more or less the same and the application also would be the same sir thank you shriram sir it was really wonderful hearing you 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 you, uh, you mentioned about perishable goods i'll tell you one uh, one matter where we didn't go into the details you know car the, the, uh, insurance will not pay you for loss cost due to inherent vice of the cargo mm -hmm. uh, one one party had exported mangoes raw mangoes it had yet to be ripened in ripen. a particular stage from the cargo mangoes had gone from mumbai to marseille in france okay. and uh, they were all put in reefer containers three reefer containers reefer means refrigerator refrigerator containers and when the cargo arrived in uh, Marcel, yes. the fruit had all rotten and water was oozing out of the container. So we checked the disc in the container. You know, I checked the disc. The temperature was perfectly maintained. There was the no chemical use. Oh, the what happened? Then I asked the. I showed them. What did you do with your mangoes? So he said he had packed the mangoes in cartons. So I said, how did you pack the car? So did you have those? Uh, dunages in between you know like each mango yeah. separated from the other or did you wrap them no he said no he wrapped it in butter paper and then kept one next to the <laughs> other so when the fruits touch each other even if you maintain a temperature there is a heat which is generated in the contact spot friction. friction so with that heat the fruit started rotting and he had stacked inside the container even you know in the container he had put 30 boxes one above the other the weight also the, the 20 weight of 29 boxes would come on the 30th box so box. after five he should have put uh, you know a support so then they reject this it's an inherent vice of the cargo so we end for improper packing so the claim was rejected so, so you really come across many such interesting matters where other than just reading the law you need to know and understand a lot of other things Yeah, even carrying and and not only that even the insurance will always have a tendency to reject no, and no. it is for you to find out a method by which you can uh, make that, them liable no, that 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 unfortunately somebody took offense when i said in one of the lectures somebody took very strong offense but that is what i have seen unfortunately in many of the indian uh, uh, state owned underwriters absolutely sir. sir we have we have the same problem transporting mangoes sir they put a chemical uh, for the mangoes to ripen even uh, by uh, air correct so we have to Calcium be very carbide. Care yes. yeah we have to be very careful that is heat generating huh. it comes under a dangerous cargo cargo 
So then the insurance premium is high and we, there is a notification to be given and all those things have to be taken care of, sir. Even mm. dry ice, we cannot carry more than 10 kilos at a given point of time. Mm. So we are very particular on what is uh, transported by air also. I mean, dry ice by itself, even to use on board the aircraft, there is a certain limit. You can't cross that limit by carrying dry ice also. Mm. So we have a lot of limitations in the air. Space is one limitation otherwise also. And then these other issues. So goods and every dangerous good that is carried, even like when we carry wheelchairs, we have to disconnect the battery. Mm. We can't carry, uh, the battery has to come separate from the Correct. wheelchair. Okay. So there are a lot of conditions put for all the cargoes to come on board the aircraft. So Correct. we have to be very careful of that. Thank you. Thank you, Rao. So we recognize the presence of Justice Vijay Lakshmi. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, over to you, Vijay. Uh -huh. Thank you. Uh, I had a lot of connectivity issues. I was joining in and uh, leaving. So I just could not follow the lecture, but I'm sure uh, Justice Sriram would have given a very exhaustive uh, lecture on this particular issue. Not that we really come across this kind of litigation, though we are one of the few high courts recognized for uh, original side with regard to marine issues. The litigation is far and few. Thank you, sir. I, because of some connectivity issues, I had joined late and I was exiting it every five minutes. I don't know why. <laughs> I mean, we had a starting trouble, but that was uh, completely taken care of. This is Vijay Lakshmi is here. I, I don't see her. Vijay Lakshmi from Andhra, is it? Yes. Oh, okay. I don't see you, sister. Under what this name is she signed? No, even, even in the participants' stores, her name was not seen. Yeah, it I is there. Hmm? What name? In K. 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 Vijay Lakshmi. Kongara Vijay Lakshmi. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, it is. I have seen that, I am sure. Ah, yes, yes, there is some. Ah, yes. I see that it's only K. With no, there, there is no Taylor's justice or something like that. So maybe. True, true. <laughs> it's not there, but I recognize. I recognize. Good evening, everybody. Yes. Sir, sir. sir evening, excellent speech. Good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. Excellent speech, sir. Thank you. Uh, I don't have experience in this branch of law. One moment. Can you switch on your video, please? Yes, sir. Let us see you. Can you hear me, sir? Yeah, no. We are hearing you, but not seen. No, I'm not able to. I'm not able to on the video, sir. Doesn't matter. Your video is on, but it's in a different angle. But doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, that's because uh, the camera would be the reverse camera would have been put on. So uh, yes, maybe one second. See, if you're on the phone, you'll have to change it. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes, uh, I mean, it just happened and now. Uh, yes. Maybe I'm not able to correct it. Uh, that, uh, you, you, you can switch off the video. <laughs> Sir. Madam was there in our group since I've, I've been noticing her for quite yes. a few times. Even uh, yes. when Justice El Nagishwara Sir was speaking. Yes, on that day uh, also I logged in. Yes, thank you. Thank you for letting me. Yes. It's a thank pleasure. You. There is some issue with Prem, so... Sir, um, hey, celebrities do not go unnoticed in our platform. <laughs> <laughs> so, sir, right, uh, brings so us to the... He had some difficulty today. <laughs> I think he has some. Yeah, he, he mentioned that. You are seeing every article except yourself, madam. Yes. That's because the camera, I think that is yes. special. Yeah. That's all right. I am not able to correct it. I don't know why. No, it's corrected. Just, uh, just yes, now getting just slowly corrected. Luckily, it is gone. <laughs> yeah. Yes, uh, yes. Now you are visible. Yeah, maintain, you know, maintain that post. Just like a ship is uh, <coughs> being yeah, seen. <laughs> Reaching the Bermuda, Bermuda Triangle. <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely correct. So, as we come to the end of the 178th session, uh, we express our gratitude and thanks to Justice Sriram, sir, for uh, uh, exposing uh, us to this uh, branch of uh, law. I mean, uh, like Ramkumar, sir, and Ramakrishnan, sir, said, uh, many of us, or almost all of us, are not much uh, I mean, aware of the nuances of marine law, especially because we don't come across much matters. I think I would have done only two or three matters, that too, uh, regarding uh, Lakshadweep and things like that, nothing to do with uh, high seas and uh, other things. But still, 
it, it was a wonderful experience knowing that and uh, uh, thanks are due to Justice Ram Kumar sir and Justice Ramushan sir for being present and for your valuable inputs and all of you wonderful participants. Tomorrow in the 179th session, we will have refugee uh, laws um, by the director of the Indian Law Institute in New Delhi. So friends, till we I, meet again tomorrow. Yes, sir. Uh, Sam, I think you can uh, book Sri Ram for topic wise also. Some of the topics may require a, a lecture on this because the laws, how it can be assessed and the contract, how it can be avoided or not avoided. All that those things good. also possible. I think that um, with the fast experience on this field, Sri Ram can able to. Sure. Sure, we'll be happy. I just remembered I wrote a judgment on this a year ago. I'll sir, give that also. Okay. <laughs> on a cargo claim. Yes. On a cargo claim. So uh, I I am not sure whether it has been carried in appeal, but uh, it was a suit, very very old suit which I disposed. I'll give that judgment uh, citation also to uh, uh, Mr. Padma. Yes, sir. I shall circulate, sir. Uh, tomorrow's topic is Refugee Laws, National and International Perspectives. Professor Dr. Manoj Kumar Singha, Director, the National Law Institute, New Delhi. So, sir, Sriram, sir, thank you very much. Thank uh, you. That thanks to carry extra weight because next time also I'll have to bother you again and I'll see to that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get you no, no, he himself has given a keen that it, some of these topics require a full class. No, it will, it will. In fact, in London, when I in my LLM course, this was one subject. So it you know, it took the whole year to cover one subject. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm. So, so thank you very much. Till thank we meet you. again tomorrow. Thank Please you. do take care and stay safe.